Harry Truman and Joseph Stalin led their nations from World War victory in 1945 through seven years of tense confrontation. By 1953, it was time for a new generation of cold warriors to take command. In Washington, the changing of the guard came democratically. The people speak, and their verdict? A landslide victory for Dwight D. Eisenhower, elected president with the greatest popular vote ever given, a White House candidate. The hero of D-Day, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, became the first Republican president in 20 years. On the campaign trail, Eisenhower pledged to take a hard line with the Soviet Union and to bring an end to the war in Korea. You have summoned me on behalf of millions of your fellow Americans to lead a great crusade for freedom in America and freedom in the world. As president, Eisenhower continued the policy of containment, but his administration's new look defense strategy relied more heavily on air power and nuclear weapons. Deploying an effective nuclear arsenal was easier and cheaper than maintaining a massive land army. Eisenhower could defend the nation, cut taxes, and curb inflation all at the same time. In the expression of the day, it was a bigger bang for the buck. The new look was not just economical, it was aggressive the White House adopted a policy of massive retaliation to deter Soviet aggression. It stated that if the Soviet Union invaded Western Europe, the U.S. would respond by launching more than 3,000 nuclear missiles against every major urban, industrial, and military target throughout the communist world. Experts estimated that such an attack would kill 285 million people. President Eisenhower, refused to consider options that stopped short of total war. But even as the Eisenhower White House was refining its Cold War strategy, news from Moscow that Joseph Stalin had died dramatically altered the playing field. The official cause was a stroke, but many suspected poison. Without a plan for succession, a collective leadership assumed control of the Soviet Union. Almost immediately, they extended an olive branch to the West. Speaking for the party, Georgi Malenkov declared, we stand as we have always stood for peaceful coexistence of the two systems. Coming from the avowed enemy of capitalism, peaceful coexistence was a radical notion. Was this just Soviet propaganda, or was the new Kremlin really different than the old? In an address dubbed Chance for Peace, Eisenhower called on the Soviets to demonstrate they had truly broken with Stalin's legacy. I know of only one question upon which progress waits. It is this. What is the Soviet Union ready to do? Whatever the answer is, let it be plainly spoken. Again, we say the hunger for peace is too great. The hour in history too late for any government to mock men's hopes with mere words and promises and gestures. Before the Soviets could respond, the president's seemingly genuine offer was contradicted by his own Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles. He ridiculed the idea of peaceful coexistence as a ploy to divide the Western allies, adding, we are not dancing to any Russian tune. The chance for peace, if it ever existed, was squandered, and U.S.-Soviet relations continued to vacillate between measured tolerance and outright disdain. Two years later, in 1955, both nations were seeking opportunities to relax Cold War tensions. They met face to face in Geneva, Switzerland for the first time since the end of World War II. Some 11 years ago, I came to Europe with an army, a navy, an air force, with a single purpose, to destroy Nazism. 
This time, I come armed with something uh, far more powerful, the goodwill of America, the great hopes of America, the aspirations of America for peace. Americans got their first good look at the new Kremlin powers at the summit. There was Soviet Premier Nikolai Bulganin, Defense Minister Marshal Zhukov, and the outspoken head of the Soviet Communist Party, Nikita Khrushchev. During discussions, Eisenhower suggested a program he called Open Skies that would permit air reconnaissance over both countries. Bulganin and Zhukov were receptive to the idea, but Khrushchev quickly denounced the idea as a bold espionage plot. After two years of uncertainty, it was clear that Nikita Khrushchev was now the top man in Moscow. Khrushchev's reason for refusing open skies was simple. His nation had been threatening the West with nuclear rockets it simply did not have and bombs it could not deliver onto American soil. These military shortcomings were a closely held secret in the Kremlin, but they would not remain secret for long. On July 4, 1957, a Lockheed U-2 spy plane made its inaugural flight over the Soviet Union. From an altitude of 70,000 feet, the U-2 captured stunningly clear images of its target. For four years, U-2 flights gathered revealing intelligence about Soviet military installations and missile deployments. But President Eisenhower feared the inevitable. Sooner or later, he said, one of these things is going to get shot down. Nikita Khrushchev was an entirely new kind of Soviet leader. He was not evil like Joseph Stalin, but in his relations with the West, he was openly defiant and often belligerent. He boasted of the Soviet Union's vastly superior nuclear capabilities that could wipe out any American or European city. True or not, Khrushchev's threats to unleash his rocket weapons on Western targets was unnerving. But for all his nuclear posturing, Khrushchev could be amiable, and at times, even likable. In 1959, he engaged Vice President Richard Nixon in an impromptu debate over the relative merits of capitalism and communism. Teach us some things, and it will teach you some things, too. Because after all, you don't know everything. That every word that you have said here will be reported in the United States and they will see you say it on television. Khrushchev would soon have a chance to witness a capitalist democracy firsthand. The President of the United States has invited Mr. Nikito Khrushchev, Chairman of the Council of Ministers of the USSR, to pay an official visit to the United States in September. Khrushchev was the first Soviet head of state ever to visit the United States. During his stay, he was exposed to the extremes of American life and culture, from movie stars in Hollywood to farm production in the American heartland. Nikita Khrushchev's American tour swings into the world's best corn country. And one of the world's most modern, efficient, and profitable farming operations Khrushchev shows an enthusiasm springing from his Ukrainian peasant background and the interest of a leader whose nation has long known major food production problems. The Soviet leader acknowledged the riches of the United States, but boasted, tomorrow we shall be as rich as you are. The next day, even richer. Meetings with President Eisenhower failed to break new ground but the two leaders bridged a divide. They pledged to meet again in Paris the following year. Khrushchev was deeply moved by his American experience. I hope that in uh, the relationships between our two countries, we will be able to use 
uh, more and more often uh, the good short American word, okay, uh, until we meet again, friends. Upon returning to Moscow, he openly declared, long live Soviet-American friendship, pledging his nation to massive cuts in its conventional military as a first step towards peace. By this time, the U-2 had revealed that the Soviets were greatly exaggerating their nuclear capabilities. Seeing continued surveillance as a diplomatic risk, Eisenhower had suspended the flights. But under pressure from his advisors, he reluctantly agreed to allow one more mission. May Day in Moscow. This year's parade through Red Square is a three and a half hour affair with emphasis on peaceful coexistence. On May 1st, 1960, as Kremlin leaders waved to the May Day crowds in Red Square, a U-2, piloted by Francis Gary Powers, was shot down over Soviet airspace. In an instant, the plane, the pilot, and any chance for peaceful coexistence came crashing to Earth. The White House had devised a cover plan for just such an occurrence. They claimed the U-2 was on a weather mission originating in Turkey for NASA and had strayed off course. The next day, they changed the story. The plane was piloted by a civilian, and the failure in oxygen equipment had resulted in the pilot losing consciousness and accidentally violating Soviet airspace. It was all rubbish. Khrushchev knew the U.S. had been flying spy missions over the Soviet Union, and now he had the evidence to prove it. The wreckage of the U-2 and the American pilot, alive and kicking. Trapped, Eisenhower finally came clean with the American public. Now, this does not put the United States on uh, trial whatsoever. At the Paris summit two weeks later, Khrushchev turned the U-2 incident into a crisis. Khrushchev outdoes his earlier outburst against President Eisenhower at the commencement of the Paris meeting. Flanked by Foreign Minister Gromyko and glowering Marshal Malinowski, he fires a barrage of threats, insults, and menaces, warns of devastating blows at bases used by American espionage planes, denounces American acts of aggression, and in general follows a tough line that seems to signal a new freezing spell in the Cold War. The captured U-2 pilot, Francis Gary Powers, was convicted of espionage against the Soviet Union and sentenced to 10 years in prison. It was August 17, 1960. That very same day, in the skies over the Pacific Ocean, an Air Force pilot snatched a falling capsule from midair. The event marked a breakthrough in the top secret project to develop Corona the world's first Earth-orbiting reconnaissance satellite. The U-2 may have been downed, but America had a new eye in the sky, and this one could capture stunningly clear and revealing images of its target from more than 100 miles in outer space. 